Kia ora koutou. I think we'll make a start. It's, uh, that clock on now is wrong. Um, so, tēnā rā koutou katoa. Ki ngā tangata whenua o tēnei rohi, uh, Ngāti Meiti, Ngāti Kree, Ngāti Soto, Ngāti Blackfoot, uh, Ngāti Nakoto Su Hoki, uh, he mihi nui tēnā koutou. Ngā hau e whā, e hōmā, tēnā rā koutou katoa. So I would firstly like to welcome all of you to this event uh, that we've called Indigenous Foucault. I would like to uh, firstly thank all of the presenters that are here today. Um, some of them have travelled from near and far, including Australia, Illinois and California. And I think we've assembled a group that is some of the most important people in our, in our discipline. I would also like to thank you all for coming today um, and supporting this event. And also like to thank the people that are being live streamed in as we speak. Um, two other thank yous. I'd like to thank Christine Ray, um, who has helped behind the scenes create this event. Thank you very much, Christine. And I'd also like to thank Kirsten Lindquist, who has given pretty much her spare time to help promote this event and has, um, I think, made it, it's going to be very popular. And also I'd like to thank Chris Anderson, who has been the co-host with me. So before I go on to introduce Professor Aileen Morton Robinson, who is hiding behind the door here, I want to say a few brief opening comments about the event itself. So why Indigenous Foucault? I think one of the less helpful yet valid criticisms or questions, questionings from some Indigenous scholars and students is, why are we using white scholars at all? Part of this is that as Indigenous scholars, we should focus on the ideas and logically the epistemologies granted in our own communities so that these worldviews come to the fore. Generally then, there is a, a political imperative that as Indigenous scholars, we explain why we use non-Indigenous scholars in our work. And Foucault is possibly, although I'm not sure about this, um, possibly the, the most referenced non-Indigenous scholar in the field of Indigenous studies at least. So this is all to say that Chris and I never envisaged, envisaged this to be an indigenous Foucault love fest. But I think another serious consideration that might come out of the symposium is thinking about the discipline of indigenous studies and what is and what is not essential to a robust critical indigenous studies. For instance, what are the alliances, what are the, the theoretical alliances we as, we as indigenous scholars are choosing to foreground as the discipline continues to move beyond its foundations in ethnic formalism. In the case of Foucault, critics might also ridicule indigenous devotees because Foucault actually did not apply his work, obviously, to any indigenous context. It could be argued then that to use Foucault's ideas in this context is problematic because his work was not designed to do this. All of Foucault's thought can be interpreted as autoethnographic in that he was fundamentally concerned with post-enlightenment truths established, how post-enlightenment truths established themselves and became accepted as universal knowledge. In relation to other cultures, however, as the post-colonial theorist Robert Young points out, Foucault was decidedly circumspect and regarded ethnology, for instance, as fundamentally misconceived. Here I will give Foucault the benefit of the doubt, however, that to apply his work to indigenous contexts would have been antithetical to the work itself, to his work itself, although it would have been obvious to Foucault that his ideas strongly resonated with post-colonial power knowledge nexus. Applying his methods here would have been fundamentally hostile to his own thinking because of the imposition of his taxonomy onto non-European cultures. Which begs the question, why use him at all? if his ontological accounts do not speak to being indigenous. Foucault's thought, Foucault's thought is also difficult to simply lay on to indigenous studies as a method, because the key ideas most relevant to our discipline radically change over time. His key ideas, I should say. For instance, Madness and Civilization, first published in 1961, provides a strong argument for the production of dominant discourses that simultaneously exclude other forms of knowledge. Transferred to the colonial context, such theorization would suggest the hegemonic suppression and taxonomic disordering of indigenous knowledges, 
in deference to a dominant imperial discourse. However, by the time Discipline and Punish is published in 1975, and then the history of sexuality the following year, his treatment of discourse as a production of discursive formation, formations rejects such a binary conception of power. So there are many good reasons for not using Foucault as indigenous scholars, but we do. And I guess this symposium is trying to understand why, and if not, why. This implicates broader questions how do we choose to limit our theoretical alliances? Is Foucault's thought a mere tool? Uh, uh, is his thought a means to an end? Or are they simply ideas that help us develop the research questions that interest us? Or do they hold godlike status for us when they shouldn't and reflect an inferiority complex? Or are they alliances that continue to shackle us to Western thought? And now here to answer all these questions is Professor Lady Morgan Robinson. <laughs> <coughs> Professor Morton Robinson is a Gwinnipool woman from Quantum Muka. As Professor of Indigenous Studies at the Queensland University of Technology, she is Director of the Australian Research Council's National Indigenous Research Knowledges, which is this, I believe. She serves on the editorial board of Australian Feminist Studies, Cultural Studies Review, American Quarterly and was recently appointed to the Journal of Critical Ethnic Studies. Aileen was elected to the Native American Indigenous Studies Association Council in 2013. Her term expired in May 2015 and between 2008 and 2010 she served as the inaugural chair and member of NACE's nomination committee. But beyond all her accolades and achievement, Professor Morton Robinson is here today because she is one of the preeminent Indigenous Studies scholars that I and I know many others have turned to for intellectual leadership and inspiration. Accordingly, her scholarship is of an extremely high level and has been for the last 15 years. She's produced books, articles, and book chapters, book chapters that have become seminal to the field, particularly surrounding the conceptualization of whiteness in relation to indigeneity, indigenous sovereignty, and the framing of an indigenous feminism. Moreover, as a preeminent scholar in her field, Professor Mont Robinson is a vitally important role model to all Indigenous scholars, and in particular to Indigenous women. Prior to meeting Aileen, I was well aware of her scholarly work. Her scholarship was, is, and will be in the future insightful, critical to the field, and inspirational. Published in 2000, Talking Up to the White Woman, Indigenous Woman and Feminism, this was a pioneering book in carving out a space that enabled Indigenous women to talk via their own epistemologies and beyond dominant white feminist discourses. For over a decade, Talking Up the White Woman has been employed in undergraduate and graduate classes all over the world. Aileen is also the lead editor of three edited collections, Whitening Race, uh, published in 2004, Sovereign Subjects, published in 2007, and Trans Transnational Whiteness Matters in 2008. All these texts are used extensively within Indigenous Studies and beyond. Aileen has over 35 refereed book, art, book chapters and journal articles in high-impact journals and with respected publishers. In my own theory and method classes that I've taught over the last decade, her work has always been seminal. For instance, her article, Troubling Business, Difference and Whiteness Within Feminism, and a 2006 article, Towards a New Research Agenda, Foucault, Whiteness, and Indigenous Sovereignty. Her new book, The White Possessive Property, Power, and Indigenous Sovereignty, was released in May 2015 by Minnesota Press. And her next book is an edited collection to be published by Arizona University Press in 2016, and is entitled Critical Indigenous Studies, First World Locations and Engagement. In sum, and in relation to her published work alone, Aileen has made a huge, significant contribution to the field and has been recognized as such repeatedly by her peers. Aileen is not merely prof uh, prolific and inspirational in her research, she is also an outstanding teacher, mentor, and a graduate advisor, which is not typically recognized in scholarly terms, yet must be accounted for in Indigenous studies, as it is a mandate for leading Indigenous schol scholars to leave a legacy. I have seen firsthand Aileen's dedication to the discipline through her tireless efforts to establish master classes particularly focused on indigenous methodologies. 
And so, colleagues and guests to Native Studies, can you all give a warm round of applause for Professor Aileen Morton Robinson? I, I don't know if he's really talking about me, but um, thank you, Brendan, that wonderful introduction. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, continuing sovereignty of the Cree people and the Indigenous peoples throughout the world. And I uh, also want to say hello to my staff who are watching the live stream and my family on Strabroke Island. So, by acknowledging First Nation people, I am doing more than just stating that for me that sovereignty prevails and always will. And I'm a long way from Quantamooka, which is uh, Moreton Bay, just outside Queensland. And for me, Indigenous relatedness is what makes all of this possible in coming together in uh, symposiums and seminars. And I'd like to thank Professors Hokafutu, Anderson and Tallbear for the invitation to present this keynote though the responsibility for its shortcomings are mine. I wish to acknowledge elders past and present, our creators and our ancestors. Before I begin this paper, I want to put in place some qualifiers. First, it is true Indigenous people do not need Foucault. Second, I will not be engaging with all of Foucault's work. Third, I am not an expert on Foucault. Only Foucault was, really. And fourth, I am interpreting Foucault's work through an entanglement and synthesis of disciplinary and Indigenous knowledges from my standpoint as a Kondamooka, Kondamooka woman. Just excuse me, I'm a bit dry. So what attracts me to Foucault is the epistemically disobedient nature of his engagement with Enlightenment thinking. It is what his ideas reveal about the history of Western episteme and the relations between power and knowledge that are important to me to think with and through as a critical Indigenous scholar. The Enlightenment and the spread of the British Empire share among other things, an epistemic intimacy. Knowledges produced during the Enlightenment shaped and were shaped by colonisation. Knowledges operationalised within discourses that continue to impact on Indigenous peoples' lives, Canada, USA, Hawaii, New Zealand and Australia. So in this paper, I outline Foucault's ideas about the relations between power and knowledge in some of his early work and then transition to discuss some core ideas about sovereignty and biopower delivered in his Society Must Be Defended lectures. This is followed by demonstrating how Indigenous sovereignties limit the kind of power that Foucault defines. I intend to be a little analytically contentious with this experiment. Different theorists define power in different ways. The concept of power can refer to the institutionalised an embodied capacity and right to dominate through a variety of means, including ideology, politics, science, religion, class, race, gender and sexuality. Early feminist theory with theorising within the West, for example, conceptualised the structure and nature of power as being connected to male domination and authority within society. Marxists alternatively argued that it's the ruling class that holds power and exercises it as owners of the means of production. In a general sense, we can say that feminists tie power to patriarchy and Marxists connect power to capitalists. Foucault too was concerned with power, but his focus was on understanding how power works, on exploring the relationships between power and knowledge. He began this work in the archaeology of knowledge, then the order of things, and his historical studies of madness, sexuality and criminality 
and then followed through with his work on sovereignty and biopower. With reference to his historical case studies, Foucault states that his inquiries were concerned with, quote, the relations between experiences like madness, illness, transgression of laws, sexuality, self-identity, knowledge like psychiatry, medi medicine, criminology, sexiology, psychology and power, such as the power which is wielded in psychiatric and penal institutions and in all other institutions with deal, which deal with individual control, end of quote. He termed his mode of inquiry genealogical because it was designed to excavate patterns of power, its workings and apparatuses. This method rejected the search for origins and took as its object and subject the relations between knowledge and power. He argued that, quote, the exercise of power perpetually creates knowledge and conversely knowledge constantly induces effects of power. Now Foucault conceives of power as a structure of actions bearing on the actions of those who are free and argues that some power relations are enabling and constraining, unstable and reversible, while others are hierarchical and relatively stable. For Foucault, these relations of power are encapsulated in his conceptions of domination and government. He states that domination cannot be reduced to brute force or one group over another. It is more about the multiple forms of domination that can be exercised in society, so not the king in his central position, but subjects in their reciprocal relations, not sovereignty in its edifice, but the multiple subjugations that take place and function within the social body. He does acknowledge that within relations of subjugation, there is little room for manoeuvre. This is in contrast to how he conceptualises government, which is more fluid and flexible, consisting of relations of power that can be reversible. It is concerned with the way subjects regulate their own behaviour, the conduct of conduct. Thus for Foucault, government is more than the actions of the state. Foucault's later conceptualisation of government includes, includes his idea of disciplinary techniques. He states that, and I quote, Discipline was never more important or more valorised than at the moment when it became important to manage a population. The managing of a population not only concerns the collective mass of phenomena, the level of its aggregate effects, it also implies the management of a population in its depths and its detail. This is clearly evident in his work on discipline and punishment and his focus on the 17th century. He insists that the expansion of discipline correlates with the invention of the humanist subject. This is of the conception of the human individual as endowed with the soul, consciousness, guilt, remorse, and other features of an interiority that can be worked on by other agents. This humanist subject came to be seen as the locus of usable energy and therefore as the focus of instrumental control, the focus, in other words, of discipline. In this way, discipline is predicated on a claim to knowledge of the human as subject. So discipline supplements a more fundamental mode of governmental power, one that is based on right and obligation. The governmental significance of discipline goes beyond the work of the military, the public service, organisations of schools and prisons. Government also involves techniques of surveillance, regimentation and classification as omnipresent features of all modern societies. Consistent with his definition of power, Foucault does not suggest that discipline is over-deterministic of the subject, but rather that it can be unsuccessful in its aims and will often be resisted. And a key point of my argument is that in modernity, we live in a disciplinary society not a disciplined one. In his later work on sovereignty and race, Foucault expands on this thesis. In society must be defended, he expands his conceptualization also of power, stating that, as I quote, as soon as one endeavours to detach power with its techniques and procedures from the form of law within which it has been theoretically confined up until now, 
One is driven to ask this basic question. Isn't power simply a form of warlike domination? Shouldn't one therefore conceive all problems of power in terms of relations of war? Isn't power a sort of generalised war which assumes at particular moments the forms of peace and the state? Peace would then be a form of war and the state a means of waging it, end of quote. In contrast to social contract theorists, Foucault was concerned with thinking beyond juridical power, bound up with the sovereignty of monarchical or democratic right. Instead, he offers a genealogy of rights from the 17th century to the present. He is not so much concerned with the subject consenting to sovereign right as he is with how consent functions. Specifically, he argues that race war has been central to the development of the judicial edifice of right in democratic as well as socialist countries. Foucault's questions about power and war arise from his inversion of Claus Fitz's war as politics by other means. For Foucault, politics is war by other means. Antagonisms, struggles and conflict are processes of war that should be analysed according to a grid of strategies and tactics. He explains how in France the history of the divine right of kings that worked in the interests of sovereign absolutism was challenged through the work of Beau Lanvilliers, who produced a counter history to that of the king, effectively introducing a new subject of rights into history. Refuting the myth of the inherited right to rule, this history of the nobility advanced the idea that because of their investments in participating in war, they too had rights. Having become legitimate and normalised, Foucault argues, the nobility's assertion of rights was utilised by the commoners as an impetus to the French Revolution. In this way, a partisan and strategic truth became a weapon of war. The commoners' assertion of rights as subjects of the crown became the rationality for war against the monarch. Within modernity, it is only by repressing the founding violence of sovereignty's emergence through war that equality can circulate as a truth constitutive of citizenship and its relationship to state sovereignty. Now, while this truth is challenged by some political theorists within modernity, the right of state sovereignty functions discursively as not being born of conflict and war, but rather of agreement between citizens and the state in terms of consenting subjects. For Foucault, antagonism, struggles and conflict are processes of race war that should be analysed according to a grid of strategic strategies and tactics because it continues within modern mechanisms of power such as government. The ensuing conflicts from the late 18th century between rulers and ruled increasingly involved a relation between a superior race and an inferior race. As Foucault argues, and I quote, the state is no longer an instrument that one race uses against another. The state is and must be the protector of the integrity, the superiority and the purity of the race. Racism is born at the point when the theme of racial purity replaces that of race struggle and when counter history begins to be converted into biological racism, end of quote. So race is defined by Foucault as a linguistic and religious marker that precedes the modern nation state. Race surfaces as a biological construct in the late 18th century because disciplinary knowledge came into being and regulatory mechanisms were developed to control the population. He describes this form of power as biopower, arguing that race became a means of regulating and defending society from itself. That is, race war continues in modernity in different forms. Sovereignty shifts from a concern with society defending itself from external attacks to focus on its internal enemies through sovereign, though sovereign right 
continues to protect its boundaries from external attacks. So politics becomes war by other means as race becomes the conduit through which the state's exercise of biopower is extended from one to let live or die to one of to let live and to make live. Now, while Foucault acknowledges there is a relationship between biopower and colonisation in society must be defended, he does not extend his analysis of sovereignty to the colonial context. And while the limitations of Foucault's work on colonisation have been addressed by a number of post-colonial theorists such as Robert Young and Homi Baba, they fail to pursue the specific ramifications of these limitations with regard to Indigenous sovereignties. What is important about Foucault's work is how race and war are tied to sovereign right. It offers us a different understanding of how colonisation operates through sovereign right as a race war whose power effect on the Indigenous population was to let live or die. So following Foucault's argument, we can deduce that the assumption of sovereignty in Australia, Canada, the USA, New Zealand and Hawaii was predicated on a myth of discovery, which functioned as a truth within a race war. So colonisation enabled the seizing, delimiting and asserting control of a, a, a geographic area of writing on the ground a new set of social and spatial relations underpinned by sovereign right and the rule of death. While Foucault's theory of biopower, sovereignty and rights is useful, it does not account for the invisible white patriarchal nature of sovereignty without which biopower could not function today within countries such as Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Hawaii and the US. It may be more productive to consider how the evolution of democracy through the spread of empire served to institutionalise white patriarchal supremacy in the form of a colonising biopower. Racial thinking and notions of whiteness were powerfully determinative of imperial maps that were broader than Foucault's genealogy of bourgeois subjectivity and its biopolitics. As I have argued elsewhere, white patriarchal sovereignty in the Australian context <coughs> derives from the illegal act of possession and is most acutely manifest in the state and its regulatory mechanisms such as the law. Therefore, possession is tied to right and to power in ways that are already racialised. So I'm arguing that the very act of possession is already presupposed as being racialised. So Foucault argues that right is both an instrument of and vehicle for the exercising of the multiplicity of dominations in society and the relations that enable their implementation. He argues that the system of right and the judicial field are enduring, ch enduring channels for relations of domination and multiple techniques of subjugation. For this reason, right should not be understood as the establishment of legitimacy, but rather the methods by which subjugation is carried out. So Foucault's ideas of rights is in marked contrast to the liberal ideal of rights as subjects consenting to and sharing in sovereign power. This is consistent with his idea of disciplinary society in which free subjects are governed via mechanisms of the state that appear to rest on consent because they have already been socialised as responsible and autonomous subjects. So following Foucault's proposition, I argue that citizenship rights, human rights and treaty rights are a means by which subjugation operates as a weapon of race war that can be used strategically to circumscribe, contain, enable or seduce citizens. So rights and race become the instruments through which the state's exercise of biopower extends from one to let live or die to one of to let live or die and to make live. The indigenous within colonisation becomes the subject of violence and possession, 
a subject that is simultaneously made to live and to let die. In this sense, the Indigenous subject is marked by its proximity to death, demonstrating most pointedly the contradictory promise of rights and to let live and make live. We need only think of the historical consistency with which the majority of Indigenous peoples in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii and the USA live in poverty, have the highest mortality rates, the poorest health, and are incarcerated at a higher rate than the rest of the population. If we trace the assertion of sovereign right over Indigenous lands, this form of domination marks racialised power relations that find expression in subjugated forms constricting and conditioning the conduct of Indigenous people so that we live in and through struggle. Biopolitical strategies position us in different contexts as made to let live, make live and to die. Our communities are drip fed the bare necessities of life through state apparatuses and mechanisms that attend to our rights. In this way, rights function as a form of subjugation. Respectively, as Indigenous subjects, we are subjected to biopower through discursive and non-discursive means. States have developed and enshrined conceptualisations of indigeneity in law and through legal definitions, entitlements and rights. So the law regulates who is entitled to be a property-owning Indigenous subject. And indigeneity marks the rights and entitlements by which subjects will be governed and disciplined through various regulatory mechanisms. We can think here of the regulations and legislation around becoming a federal, federally recognised tribe within the USA or recognition of native Hawaiian status or qualifying for an Indian citizenship under the Canadian law, under Canadian law or recognition of native title rights in Australia or iwi seeking compensation under the Treaty of Waitangi. I want to return now to Foucault's proposition that we need to think beyond juridical power bound up with the sovereignty of monarchical or democratic right to reveal some limitations. Foucault's work enables us to understand how a colonising biopower in its multiple forms operates within modernity, but it carries certain enlightenment assumptions. Foucault may be epistemologically disobedient and rebellious, but he could not entirely abandon his enlightenment pedigree. Foucault's conceptualisation of sovereignty, rights and biopower is nuanced and complex but it rests on centering the human subject as one that can be regulated, disciplined, enabled and contained through its relations with the ubiquitous sovereignty that non-Indigenous humans have produced through race war. So sovereignty in the sense becomes almost metaphysic, physical, while biopower is humanised. It is operationalised by humans against and for humans. It functions through knowledge circulating within discourses, mechanisms, apparatuses and institutions created by humans. In this sense, biopower relies on human capacity and knowledges. So the human race war continues in modernity and rights are tactics and strategies of war deployed in a power relationship with sovereignty. A sovereignty that, while being omnipresent, requires the concept of Indigenous rights in order to function and recognise itself. This is why I argue that treaties, native title and tribal sovereignty primarily take the form of rights, responsibilities and entitlements. Sovereignty must be able to recognise itself, to see its reflection. It is narcissistic and self-serving. In this sense, it can only misrecognise forms of Indigenous sovereignty through regulatory and disciplinary mechanisms and what I consider to be a discourse of repossession. While what I refer to as a discourse of repossession involves how state regulatory mechanisms deploy techniques of rationality to constantly reconfigure the terms and conditions of Indigenous treaties, citizenship and land tenure that it has produced 
in order to take back or limit what it has conferred. In this sense, the power effect of sovereignty are to, in, to re reproduce its very likeness, right? So it can only see itself. This not, should not be surprising, as one of the Enlightenment's presuppositions was that the humanist subject could know itself through and beyond an other. Quite a metaphysical feat. Foucault would agree Western epistemologies have metaphysical traces, but as an enlightened transcendent subject, he would perhaps think he was beyond them. Western ways of knowing are predicated on disconnected relations with the earth. In this way, the God trick is deployed in the production of knowledge. Western knowledge is simultaneously the view from everywhere and nowhere and is the arbiter of everything worth knowing. The distinct metaphysical traces embedded within Western knowledges predispose Western theorists to particular ways of understanding and interpreting the world. Foucault is no exception. Native American scholar Clayton Dumont argues that within disciplinary knowledges, and I quote, perhaps the most unrecognised yet commonly recited of our Christian inheritances are the following interrelated notions, that we are in disciplined pursuit of a difficult to uncover world of essential truths and that these truths are arranged systematically as patterns, rules, laws or some other form of internal logic in some grand teleological scheme. Yet we know, at any state, I love this quote. I, I just, I'll, I'll slow down and read it out because I just love it. Uh, here goes. Yet we know objective reality, they cannot find it. Objective research, they cannot do it. Nonetheless, they continue to insist that despite being beyond their reach, both are real. How can we understand this as other than a fate? based, inherited and institutionalised pursuit of a metaphysical ideal. So the metaphysical basis of sovereignty within Foucault's theory is evinced by his idea that power is everywhere. He requires us to study, quote, biopower by looking, as it were, at its external face, at the point where it relates directly and immediately to what we might very provisionally call its object, its target, its field of application, or in other words, the places where it implants itself and produces its real effects, end of quotes. So Foucault's analytics are concerned with how biopower operates within a race war rather than who holds power. However, if colonising biopower exists everywhere, it must be in an inert, ubiquitous state until it is operationalised by humans. There is no sense in which power can exist and be activated from humans and the techniques, apparatuses and procedures they have invented. That's his logic. So Foucault does acknowledge in some ways, there are limits to biopower. While apparatuses of the state may function to let live and make power, make live, this form of power is limited by the capacity of the subject to take their own life. In this analysis of relations between power and knowledge, power is diminished the further removed one is from regulatory and disciplinary mechanisms. The epistemological presupposition here is that power is tied to the capacity of humans and their creations. His conceptualisation of biopolitical relations is congruent with his idea of a free and consenting self-regulating subject who can be docile, resistant, evasive and self-possessed. So while Foucault was interested in exploring the relations between power and knowledge, biopower is not disengaged from sovereignty, rights and race war. These relations are not kinship-based, nor are they predicated on being connected to all living things, and they disavow a powerful and active earth. This idea of the relations between biopower, disciplinary knowledges and the state <coughs> um, is not how Indigenous scholars theorise Indigenous sovereignty. 
which we posit as intimately tied to place, kin, collective rights, responsibilities, obligations, stories, land and law. Sovereignty and power find expression within culturally specific gendered ontologies, axiologies and epistemologies that are connected to the earth. So sovereignty is constituted by our histories, our culturally embodied knowledges and the life force that connects us to our respective lands, our creators, our ancestors, our stories and all our human and non-human relatives. Our sovereign ancestral lines to country are the umbilical cords to what has gone before us, the present and also what is yet to come. I am not here appealing to an authentic <coughs> pre-colonial and co colonial past that was static. Indigenous peoples continue to be creative, innovative and enduring human beings who produce knowledges. Instead, I am privileging Indigenous logics by following the mode of indigenous rationalities from knowledge systems that function and endure beyond the limits of colonial biopower. Knowledges that connect us to place and space, that tell us how we come to know who we are, who we can claim to be, as well as who claims us and how we are connected to our lands. This is a matter of ontology, our being, not a matter of an identity that has been presupposed through colonial regulatory apparatuses of the state and disciplinary knowledges. In this way, our knowledge systems inform our sovereign practices, whereby relations between power and knowledge are inextricably linked to our lands and the immediacy of our lives as Indigenous peoples. Let me give you a few examples. I read Brendan Hokafuta's work on Indigenous existentialism with reference to Māori resistance movement in New Zealand as arguing that as sovereign subjects, we can be willful, traversing the lived conditions of colonial possibility by transcending the pre-colonial or colonial past. Okafuto mindfully reminds us there, there is freedom to make choices and be responsible, to be sovereign, to act willfully within the immediacy of our indigeneity in our modernity. This capacity to act as Indigenous sovereign subjects is also clearly evidenced in the work of Audra Simpson. In Mohawk Interruptus, Simpson provides an excellent analysis of how refusal operates. This refusal is not ontologically grounded in the Canadian state. It resides in Mohawk, unvanquished sovereignty, grounded in their historical knowledges, in genealogies, genealogies in origin stories, of lands with uncontested boundaries, in how they live their lives and define themselves. Rob Innes's work with the Kawasas First Nation people demonstrates how Elder Brother and the law of the people demonstrates the power of kinship, of story, of how one should live one's life with respect to all of one's relatives, place and lands. This ontology express, is expressed through stories most importantly in terms of who you are related to and how you follow elder brother law. I read Chris Anderson's work on Métis identity as illustrating how Métis sovereignty was born of war but linked to place and relatedness as much as it is ontologically grounded by the native women who shared their rights to land and their love with white men. In Glenn Coulthard's Red Skin's White Mask, I read sovereignty as expressed in indigenous, indigenous resurgence and the call to assert our presence in our territories. And I quote, deeply informed by the land as a system of reciprocal relations and obligations and what that can teach us about living our lives in relation to one another and the natural world in non-dominating and non-exploitative terms. Hokafido's challenge to move beyond the limits of colonial power finds our third expression in everyday practices, from watching and making television to attending land language revival school or Aboriginal crobberies, seafaring practices, powwows and orations on the marae. These Quidonian practices and others enable the nourishing of sovereign well-being because they are places where our cultural discourses flourish sustained by our knowledges and truths. 
The existence of places of celebration and sharing supports our sovereignty and discursive and material spaces for embodied cultural practices and knowledge production are where the capillary power effects of colonising biopower become subdued or limited as another form of power flows from the land and into bodies that are incommensurate in their ontological existence. Bodies that willfully struggle for life beyond the pathological discourses that constantly seek to annihilate our sovereign being. The Indigenous struggle against the discourse of perpetual repossession in its many forms, including rights, is a daily occurrence. Now, the work of these Indigenous scholars reveal forms of racial subjugation and domination and their connectedness to apparatuses of knowledge and regulation function. They unmask not only the enabling and constraining dimensions of racialized power, they also expose the incrementability of Indigenous sovereignties as different forms of power exercised by Indigenous peoples. Sovereignties that can subdue and limit biopower because the disciplinary knowledges and regulatory mechanisms deployed to erase or displace it are constitutive of and constituted by a different episteme. Indigenous sovereignties, indigenous sovereignties that are made to live with a conceptual schemata of classification, order, value, hierarchy, differentiation, identity, discrimination and identification, exclusion, domination, subjection and subjugation, as well as entitlement and restriction. All these enable biopower to function and they come out of the Enlightenment. <coughs> In conclusion, I want to return to where I began to reiterate that the importance of Foucault's work for me is what it reveals about the workings of biopower within modernity. How race is embedded in the workings of power and how government and domination operate through procedures, apparatuses and mechanisms that discipline and regulate. And in this sense, I find his work extremely useful. He provides understandings about how rights are tactics and strategies of race war within modernity, which underpins his thesis that sovereignty shifts from a concern with society defending itself from external attacks to focus on internal enemies such as Indigenous peoples. Through sovereign right, and that and while well, sovereign right continues to protect the boundaries from external attacks. So politics becomes war by other means as race becomes a mechanism through which the state's exercise of biopower is extended from one to let, of to let live or die to one of to let live and to make live. For me, one of the key limitations of Foucault's work is his conceptualisation of a right of sovereignty, which he explains on the one hand, I mean, I've given some idea that, but I'll use this quote. On the one hand, a legislation, a discourse, and an organisation of public right articulated around the principle of sovereignty of the social body and the delegation of individual sovereignty to the state. And we also have a tight grid of disciplinary coercions that actually guarantees the cohesion of that social body. Clearly in this definition, he conceptualises sovereignty as more than judicial edifice. However, despite its expansive, fluid and collective nature, Traces of sovereign absolutism function discursively in that there can only be one form of sovereign right. In this way, Foucault stays within the boundaries of the Enlightenment episteme. Sovereignty remains contractually as a relationship between individuals and the state, between humans and the apparatuses they have created. This conceptualization of sovereignty rests on enlightenment presuppositions that nature is servant to humanity and humanity is master of nature. Indigenous sovereignties are not limited in this way. Instead, our knowledge systems acknowledge the power of the earth, the limitations of human endeavour to control it and the need to live in respectful and proper relations with all living things. Foucault was brilliant but in exploring how power works within Western societies, he never really explains how to surrender it. And while Western sovereign right can let live, make live, 
and die. It does not possess the power to give life to everything. Perhaps it is time for a new theory of sovereignty, one that is less concerned with Western humanist endeavours and right than it is with the survival of the earth. Thank you. Well, that was, uh, that was brilliant, uh, Eileen. Um, we have time for, for questions, so... So questions, please. Comments or discussion, anything you would like. Okay. Just regulate and discipline me right up here. I'm doing it. <laughs> That's the best paper on Foucault I ever heard, Aileen. The Earth, thank you. <laughs> it's probably the hardest paper I've ever had to write. Vince. Where were you when we were in grad school? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh thank you very much. I mean, really, that was, that was, uh, that was brilliant and and that was the best paper I've read on, I've heard on Foucault. Um, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm not ready to let human, humanity's base inquiry. Uh, I'm not ready to give, give that all to Western epistemology. Mm -hmm. That we have, we also have humanities mm -hmm. based indigenous mm -hmm. critiques, uh, some of which is remarkably like Foucault. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, for example, the idea that, uh, oh, one of the favorite ones for me is the, um, the idea of, uh, of an Anishinaabe cosmology as, as uh, on the back of a turtle. And it's turtles all the way down. Yeah. That's narrative, yeah. right? And and and, uh, and and not superstitions, of yeah. course, yeah. right? So, but there's there's a there's a there's a radical critique in there, mm -hmm. right? That I don't want to lose. I'm not saying you're losing it, you know, but I I, I don't I I want to see uh, not equivalences, but um, possible analog analogs or <laughs> correspondences between the radical disobedience that he gives us, right? Um, and some of our own, our own uh, uh, critiques. Mm -hmm. they, may, they, may not, they, may, they may not be epistemological systems, they may not be uh, uh, ontologies. Uh, I, I, li I like the idea that they're organic and they're they're uh, out there in the everyday. I like the idea a lot, and I'm, he's, he's attracted me because of a kind of latent unsystematicity, in, especially in, in a kind of refusal of his own to present uh, coherent mm -hmm. unities. Mm -hmm. And what kind of practice does that, does that give us? Um, so, um, yeah, I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think he's, um, he's an important thinker of, in terms of when you, are, when, you are, when you are raised outside of that epistemy for most of your life and then you are taken into it in a big way, you understand that you're immersed in this thing of which you do not know but you only know that you don't know because of what you see that's actually different from 
the humanism by which you've been raised. Yeah? So he, what he does for me is he pulls back things so that I, it's like I'm looking and I can, I can see in a way in which I can't see. You know, so um, it, it, was, um, it was really, um, I was an honour student. Believe, I was a staunch Marxist. Um, as an honours student, I was oh, right there uh, in the revolution. Um, and uh, I kept having a um, constructive dialogue with my supervisor, who was Barry Hindus. And uh, Barry was, is an, a Foucauldian scholar. And uh, I, I, so, I, so it was Marx versus Foucault. And I spent all of my time arguing with him, really, during honours, my honours year only to sort of come to Foucault many years later and then to understand what it is I didn't know and why Barry was sort of trying to get me to read him. I was just refusing, you know. Um, and, um, but I do think that when we think about uh, the idea of race war and that we are at war and politics is war by other means, then it is about what kind of weapons do we equip ourselves with in order to fight in that race war? And how do we learn to develop um, our epistemological weapons? And I think that he doesn't give you that, but what he gives you is you see how it gets done. Because it's the how question for him, it's not the why question. But in, in understanding the how question, you can actually then begin to see how things function and the possibility of interventions. So I think that his work in that sense is very strategic. Um, and I, you know, feminists have deployed it in different ways. There's huge arguments, of course, in feminism about his you know, lack of focus on gender and stuff like that. But I think... Um, for me, he's taught me more about where, where, the, uh, where the epistemology came from that actually sought to construct us in particular ways. That's what he's taught me. And once I could get a handle on that, it was, OK, so now I need to deconstruct that. Yeah? Yes. This young man down the back. Um, first, thank you. Um, and so Foucault also famously argued that there's no outside to power. And if, as you argue, that Western knowledge is simultaneously everywhere and nowhere, and if um, like treaty rights and indigenous sovereignty find themselves inside settler governance, as you've argued, and also as Audre Simpson argues too, um, what does that mean for decolonial and anti-colonial struggles that are trying to, um, to do away with that kind of power or settler sovereignty when that sovereignty and power is simultaneously always bound up in indigenous peoples as subjects, um, a power that's always bent on obliterating us, right? Well, I, <coughs> I think it's clearly evidence that, you know, we've, back, we've been incorporated into the state via rights, right? So we can't get out of that. But the limits of the power are in terms of the subject. So it's about what we can do in different kinds of ways to um, think through and talk about and, and, and reveal those kind of constraints. Um, I, you know, I don't ever think of, see, I don't, I don't in one sense ever think of, um, he's saying that they're all powerful, that we're never out of power. I'm disagreeing, right? Because what I'm saying is that he was ignorant of the fact that other forms of power pre-existed the West. Right, so that's, there are limits to his power. So that's what he says, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying no, you're limited. Um, and again, it's about, you know, when, you, if, if, when you're within a system that constantly differentiates you in particular ways, then you of course know that power exists. But what is it that you can do to limit the differentiation? And there are certain things that you can do, you know. You can kill yourself, you do have that option. Um, but you can also um, be political and in the care of the self, he starts to talk more about the way in which his idea of politics was really about the care of the self. How can you become and work towards being a non-oppressive subject? 
And my thesis is how do we theorise about learning? How do we theorise about giving up power? All the theories tell you about what power is, but nobody wants to theorise about how do you actually give it up. Now, that's the point that we start. How do we theorise about giving up? I put that out to feminists some um, 15 years ago. Still haven't got the answer, but you know. So I, I'm so so I'm interested in that idea of you know thinking about ways of giving up power. How do we become less possessive? Because in one sense, if we don't, we will actually destroy the earth that has the power to give life to everything. And I'm going to end it on there because I'm I I sort of need to go somewhere. <laughs> Brendan. <laughs> you sure? Yes. Okay. Can, well, I can, can I come back? Yeah. Talk much as <laughs> Please stay because she'll be back. Or you can have to stay. Please. I'm so nervous in a room full of grown ups. Um, I was just wondering if you could elaborate. I was trying to take notes, but um, if you could elaborate on the point about. Um, what it is that we were talking about uh, how society defends it's defending society from itself mm -hmm. and the internal enemy and um, it, we require the notion of treaty rights um, and so on so that it is able to recognize itself so I think I know what you mean by that but like I'm not totally sure okay right so I'm just gonna let you re-explain <coughs> it to me okay so, um, the idea of sovereignty, as, as it's configured in, in Western political theory, right, mm -hmm. is it's about in the internal integrity of the territory and that it can defend it and that supposedly citizens share in that through their citizenship, they contract in with the state, right? That's yeah, the yeah. stuff that he says it doesn't work like that. And, but sovereignty, even, even as Foucault deploys it, is still really about something that needs to see itself, right? So it, it can't really deal with my people's conception of their sovereignty, which is about an embodiment, an ontological relationship to country that mm -hmm. can't exist anywhere else, right? So I cannot be, uh, you know, a, a Cree person, mm -hmm. right? So there's a, there's a sense in which that sovereignty, Indigenous sovereignty, can't be moved or changed, whereas in, this, in the Western sense, it can't see that epistemology. So what it must do is develop something that it can recognise. So what does it recognise? It, it recognises recognizes rights, and, and rights. It creates those kinds of things so that it, so that so that it can engage with itself. Be, yeah. And so it can regulate, right, and do all those things for itself. Mm 
Yeah. That's why it's narcissistic and self-serving. Completely. And sure. that's what that's the relationship we're in. Uh-huh. Right? Is we're in this relationship with the state which constantly wants to repossess you the whole time, right? So, you know, we'll change the legislation over here so we can add less people in as under Indian citizenship or we will actually decide that well, we're not we're not going to uphold our our end of the bargain in terms of this treaty. So it constantly will take it'll give and take, give and take, but it's always in that sense of repossessing and taking from the indigenous for yeah, itself for itself in order to regulate us because we are the internal enemy. We are the unfinished business upon which the sovereignty sits. Yeah, you know, so we are the internal enemy. And then if we want to even think about that and how the treatment of refugees plays into that in terms of making them an internal enemy, right? And the way in which people who are citizens of America are still, you know, if they seem to be Muslims, they're an internal enemy. So would so you, it's another question, would you say that anyone who <coughs> chooses to be an ally of indigenous people, would they be an enemy as well? Like within its... Like within the, do you know I, what I mean? I, well, I'd say you're not in the same way, right? Not in the same way, because you can opt in or out of that position. Versus whereas where we don't you get to do that. Yeah, it's okay. like white race privilege, you know. We don't kind of get to have a lot of that. Um, so you can choose to be a part of the, you know, anti-racism, or you can decide just to live your life. Yeah, you know. So it's kind of it's a different configuration different. in that sense. But the you know we are the we are the internal enemies. That's why we've got to constantly be regulated. But it's why we, when I talk about our drip feeding, it's the bare necessities, mm-hmm. and sometimes not even that that we're given. You know we still have communities in Australia that you know where clean water is still a problem. Yeah. So, uh, hello. Um, and so it's that sense in which constantly regulating, disciplining, you know, changing, changing laws, um, changing policy, um, you know, taking, taking, give you a bit, take, give you a bit, mm-hmm. take, you know, and how does it do it through rights entitlements? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there, the, that's what what Foucault um, only really gave a name to something that I already knew. Exactly. Right. So I use him because I have to. Mm-hmm. Because Indigenous knowledges don't hold the epistemologically privileged position within the academy. So we have to find people we can fight with. I like it. Yes. Keep it up. Uh, no, I plan to retire soon. So, um, But that's for the young ones. The young ones that are take it up. The young ones. Jess Colapene. We do have one question from the live stream viewers. Uh, this is from Lisa. The question is, what is your response to Foucault's concept of panopticon and its relationship to indigenous wellness? Oh, can I uh, take that on notice? Because that's, that's a question that I really would need more time to think about, to be in all honesty. That's a big question. It's not a five minute question. That's my answer. However, I'd be interested in knowing what Lisa has to say about it. About a 30 second delay in the stream, so give her a moment and she may reply. (laughs) Come on, let me go. Gee, you get your money's worth here, don't you? (laughs) Um, Okay, so we talked about uh, how. Uh, how indigenous people have experienced uh, domination by the state and other forms. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, what in Foucault have you found helpful for understanding the ways in which indigenous subjects in the state are invested in the power structures that are also dominating them? Well, that's what he says, what is what happens. Right? He tells you that. That is what happens. That you will become disciplined as a subject because of tech particular mechanisms and regulations that are in place. And one of the things that... That's why, uh, you know, having a, bringing in 
to the effect a counter discourse um, is to me really important. You know, we have to start having those kind of courageous conversations and revealing the fact that we are complicit within those mechanisms <coughs> and regimes of power. And I think that, um, you know, that can be, that can be operationalised. But again, we have to think strategically about how we do that. And having something like the Indigenous Foucault Symposium is a major intervention um, in, you know, I'm really looking forward to hearing what my colleagues will say tomorrow. And um, I think that there's a, you know, there's a sense in which, you know, we, we are still finding our ground within the academy because we're new. You know, we're the subjects that shouldn't be here because we are the internal enemies. And even within institutions, you can be positioned as the internal enemy just by the very structures that control and contain you um, and won't let you give expression to Indigenous knowledges or any power. Yep. Can, yep. I really hate this, hey? No? Yep. <laughs> I can just see all these faces smiling and it's like, I really would like to go home now. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you very much again for your wonderful talk, Professor Martin Robinson. Um, I have a question and uh, I was just I guess maybe it's more a provocation than a question. I was very interested in what you had to say about this kind of moment when uh, indigenous people, indigenous rights, uh, indigenous movements can turn away from disciplinary power and um, assert their own sovereignty. And um, it brings to mind um, the scholarship of uh, Tanya Murray Lai, an anthropologist from the University of Toronto. And she's written on um, groups of um, indigenous people and others in Indonesia who come to a point where they um, no longer buy into the developmental disciplinary structure of the World Bank and have a Marxist moment mm -hmm. where they switch and engage in revolution. Mm -hmm. So I was very captivated also to hear your uh, educational genealogy and how you had a, a Marxist background and I, I'm just maybe if, if hopefully in this uh, ramble there's I would just be interested in hearing from you how perhaps instead of a um, indigenous modernity, maybe there's an indigenous postmodernity here, and in that, in that there's different types of theoretical approaches um, on 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 the stage that are that are maybe working together. So. I would just say that that she's actually buying into the judicial idea of right in terms of, and that's what Marxist, that's what Foucault would say about the Marxist kind of stuff with revolution. And I guess I want to make it clear, I'm not arguing about us choosing to turn away. I am saying our very being is about turning away. Our very existence is about turning away, right? And it's what, what it, Audra Simpson talks about, Mohawk refusal, right? It's just we don't, we don't see ourselves our, how we're defined by the state in that sense. And we don't see necessarily our relations to where we're from as being predicated on what the state decides that we are. So in, a, in, the, in the immediacy of our indigeneity, within our modernity, within our modernity, not the West modernity, um, to me what we're doing is it's, you know, let me put it to you this way. If the state itself did not understand that we were an enemy within, onto, you know, in terms of our, our, way of, our way of being, then why must it seek to regulate us to, and kill us to the degree that it does? Right? If it, if, if it, if it, because it recognises us as the internal enemy. But the question is, why? Why does it recognise this? So what is it about you know, being Cree or Māori or Hawaiian, that is so problematic for this sovereignty, right? So there has to be something about our existence that ontologically disturbs sovereignty. And in that very disturbance, to me, is the sense in which we are, you know, refusing 
So it's not a choice thing of the subject, it's actually embodied. Okay, so that's a... Well, that's a bit of a stream of consciousness thing. <laughs> Can I go? No. Thanks. <laughs> I hope this has gone off. Is that stop this no, live stream or something? So why? It's a why question. Why hold on to a kind of some the need for a different kind of sovereignty? Um, why? Um, <laughs> Who me or Foucault? Yeah, to you. Me. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, it seems to me that that uh, the the edge of of discursive analysis was could also be extended to other other realms, other forms, and it could be that the the limitation is at the level of how di we understand discourse rather than sovereignty. No, I would want to, no, I'm going to challenge you on that, Vince, because I actually think that the importance of, under, for me, it's the embodiment of it, right? So it's not about whether I choose, right? And it's not a matter of, dis of entering into the limits of a discourse about it. It's about the fact that I exist and my people exist, right? And their very existence is about an embodied sovereignty, what? with an umbilical cord to country. So the creator's made us and that is where we are and that is who I am and that is where I come from. I cannot shift from that in the sense that that is basically where we, our existence came into being. So if I want to... Um, and, and it is a way in which I was raised and it's a way in which I encounter the world, and, and as do other Kwandamooka peoples. I mean, there's, there's no coincidence that, you know, we, Kwandamooka gave birth to some of the biggest political activists in Australia, Dennis Walker and Woodrow Nunakal. You know, it's, it's like a... And so, for me, it's about the sense in which I am ontologically tied to a particular tract of country. Well, and I can understand... What I understand is the sovereignty that seeks to prevail and constantly um, do things to this to this group of people, right? But I also see what, how these group of people really, at one level, do what they what they do in terms of their decisions. And it's whilst there's a regulation in terms of the state, it's like yeah, you comply and you resist, but it doesn't doesn't seek to like we are we are quantum muka. of sovereignty to to describe that power that, or that being right and I guess the question is still wh why sovereignty uh, because of the very argument I make sovereignty can only recognize itself so if I use the term it can at least go ha huh, there's a light I can see something here but what is it right so it's a t it's a tactic in of uh, of the war for me I use sovereignty rather than use a language name for it, right? Because it is about that stuff that sovereignty can only re only see itself. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, to the state is, why don't you just kind of admit that you can't see our sovereignty, that what you've constructed is yourself in order to contain us in particular ways? And what would the world look like if our sovereignties were allowed to be, and it was the way in which we live and inhabit our, our world, our, uh, you know, in our communities, as opposed to the regulations imposed from outside, that sense of freedom, you know, and again, that's still circumscribed, but, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not pushing for it, something utopian, I'm just trying to say that there is a different way to be a human on this planet and there is a different way to be 
and that if we can think more along the lines of sharing and caring for country and caring for one another, then we can actually be less possessive subjects. We don't have to live through the logic of capital, right? Which is tied to sovereignty, a particular form of sovereignty. And at some point that has to happen within the, we have to start doing some really hard work around the kind of knowledges that we're producing because we're still producing knowledges that harm the planet. And when, you know, we need to create a counter discourse. My concern is for the future. You know, my life is over. My concern is for my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. And, you know, I... Anyway. Sorry. This is like you're on a roll now. I just like for, so thank you very much, Eileen. It's been really fascinating, and I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you a hard one. Can we imagine, well, I can imagine, I'm sure you can too. Uh, let's talk about indigeneity outside of settler relation kind of governmentalities. So I'm thinking of Hawaii before Lili Okalani was overthrown. Um, I'm thinking of Tonga right now. I'm thinking of Papua New Guinea which has had independence and has had indigenous governance since 1965, 70. So we have examples where we have indigenous peoples who are governing their own land, who have constitutions that say the landowners are in ownership and have rules and rights and can control everything that happens on their own land. And yet we still have what Foucault would recognize as those productive, capillary, biopower kinds of relations happening. So how does that figure? Okay, so I'm gonna just go, in. you've asked me about peoples that I feel I shouldn't speak for. I only know, I, I know something about Hawaii, so I'm gonna just have a go at that. Um, you know, the reason why the kingdom came into being from the work of uh, Kahalani Kawanui and um, Noe Noe de Silva is in one sense to form a position that it could, it could become far more entrepreneurial. But it was also about trying to keep and, and, and keep people together. But it still operated fundamentally through genealogy and it still does. So the kind of reckoning of what it is to be a native Hawaiian or Kanaka Maoli is very much through genealogy, which is kind of not, you know, how the West fundamentally recognises itself, the old family, it's, it's not. And the kind of productive relations that pre-existed, I guess, um, or the mode of production that existed in Hawaii. Um, the Ahupua. It, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't um, well, thank you for correcting me, it's very white of you. Um, you know, is very, very much about, um, nice sorry, but it's true, right? You, you know, you just interrupted me in midstream and I found that really rude. Let, let me just say that. No, it's not about apology, it's about thinking before opening mouth. Um, so I, I actually think that the kinds of, the mode of production that pre-existed, I wouldn't necessarily pull that into a capitalist mode of production in the same way. So I wouldn't, and I wouldn't actually say that biopower is operating in the same way prior to the, so the taking of, of the kingdom. I wouldn't say that. It wasn't, wasn't to me from what I've just read and I don't pretend to be a knower of Hawaii, which obviously you believe you are. Um, that, you know, that, that's just my very limited view of it. So, what's your idea of it? Why don't you tell me, you ask the question. Well, I, I find it really troubling and I find it a really interesting challenge is to think with Foucault, as we're trying to do here, um, but to think outside of the position where we are so circumscribed by being part of a settler society. Australia is a settler society. Canada is a settler society. No, Hawaii it's not. No, they're, oh, sorry, they're not settler societies. Our governments are based on being they're settlers. They're not settler societies. Then what do you mean they are? They're colonising societies. They're societies that have invaders that, that illegally occupy our lands. Yes. 
Okay. So this they're not is what I mean aside. by settler society. So. Yeah, well, let's just forget about okay. that concept because okay. that concept is highly problematic and the fact that you buy into it says something. So the problem with the term indigeneity and the genealogy of the term indigeneity is one that for Tongans, which, by the way, I am part of, so please don't make assumptions by looking at me about who you think I am. I just, so know, I just know by what, how you can pass in ways so which others can't. Tongans are, are so facing sorry, a real I challenge. I apologise for racialising you in that way. Thank you. Ch facing a real challenge to grasp the idea of what it is to be Indigenous when they think that to be Indigenous means one must have been colonised. And then how do we talk about indigeneity and Foucault in that kind of context? This is part of the overall challenge. Yeah, but is... So, wait a minute. So you're telling me that Tongans don't see themselves as being colonised? The yep. major no, no, Tongan the episteme yeah. is that we are not colonised. Yep. We're the only ones who were not colonised. Yeah, okay. So, and that has got to do with... This is what is said. I'm not understand. disagreeing. Like, Brendan, I would not say that that's not true. But this is what is said. We are not colonized. We were the only ones not colonized. Yeah. So I'm still trying to work out how that relates to Foucault. If they're saying they're not colonized... And yet there are still regimes of biopower existent in Tongan society. So the biopower is not necessarily prefigured by Western epistemic governmentality. It existed from time immemorial, from when Tangaloa came down from the sky. Mm -hmm. Those forms of biopower have been existent and are still, and are actually pri prioritized culturally. This is important ways of thinking about how one is, who one is, how one is connected biologically to the land and to the ocean around it. Okay. Well, I was just going to say that's not my understanding of biopower, right? I mean, when Foucault talks about race, he's not actually talking. He is actually, in one sense, talking, and he does discuss it to some degree in Society Must Be Defended, about superiority, white superiority. He's talking about the West, Right, so his idea of biopower is about then regulating um, races within. So if you're saying to me that there's no, they say there's no colonisation, but the biopower operates. So who is the superior race as opposed to the subordinate in Tonga? Well, the superior race would be those whose genealogy ties them most closely biologically and through their ancestry, th through the genealogical connections, to Tangaloa. So you're saying that Tongans have a form of blood quantum? Absolutely. Right. And so where did that come from? Tangaloa. It comes, it's considered to be the way that the world is. One can, and, and in Hawaii also, one can garner, one can breed <laughs> for yeah. stronger forms of mana. I'm not going to take on Maori stuff because Brendan's here. <laughs> Well, um, I think it's a good place to end. I mean, that's a good question, and I, I, I agree with Aileen. It's uh, not how I would determine biopower because I think the way, well, the way that Foucault talks about biopower is kind of the regulation of life mm. through kind of the corporeal. But, um, you know, I think it's a good challenging question, but I, I would kind of, your original question was um, how do we think about forms of indigenous societies that are self-governing. And I, I, guess, I guess I think we're kind of, that kind of takes us away from the, the main point of Aileen's discussion, because I, I, I guess maybe you're trying to say that, I don't know what you're trying to say in terms of self-governance, but that, yeah, that, that, their, that their ways, ways of self-regulating are just as oppressive. normative and as oppressive as, I, I don't know, is that what you're saying? Well, that was just an avenue provided to you by the episteme that in which you are living. So at least you are giving an option, which 
is empowering, and that's, I think, incredibly valuable and wonderful. And so that option to me seems to be what you're saying, and I think if I understood correctly, it's based on um, your indigenous understanding of how your indigeneity exists and comes from and w where it belongs, where it's rooted outside uh, or necessarily away from a Western way of, th of thinking about that. Yeah, and, and look, uh, the other side, I, I'm just, if I can just interrupt and be rude, um, what I want to say is that we shouldn't, sometimes we shouldn't assume that Tongan's idea of self-regulation is actually biopower in operation, right? We, sh we shouldn't assume that because the kind, like, the kind of regulatory mechanisms that are my understanding is it's through genealogy. Yep. So I'm, try so I'm trying to get my head around your question in terms of biopower is not based on genealogy in its configuration. It's not. So I'm trying to, I'm just, you know, my head is doing this kind of thing in this question that you're asking me because it's like, I'm, you know, I'm, tr I'm trying to kind of, um, and I don't know anything about Tonga, so I'm, you know, but I'm still trying to work that out. I mean, how, how, does, uh, how does a culture that configures itself through genealogy, how does that become a mechanism of biopower? Like, how, do we, how does that happen? And I'm trying to work that out, given the fact that my understanding, again, of um, Polynesian cultures and to you know we don't, and in Australia we don't have a, a, a there's usually not a word for race mm. Mm. okay yeah. so this is what I'm saying it's kind of there's an epistemy over here that's saying it's about race it's about biopower and a particular functioning and then you're wanting me to think over here about Tongans that to me and may not necessarily kind of do that kind of stuff in the way, you know, like so, so for me it's, it's, it's about you thinking with his stuff makes me think, and, and the fact that I don't know, mm. but I do know that, that one is based on, on biology and the other's on genealogy and I don't necessarily see those as the same things. So that would be my answer, my long-winded answer. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that's a good note to end. Uh, Aileen, I, I was um, inspired by your talk, and of course, whenever you talk, I, I learn so much, and you've been a great mentor, intellectual mentor for me, so I really, really appreciate your talk, and I appreciate that. Uh, what time is it in Australia right now? Yeah, I know that. So I'm just I appreciate there. that I Aileen has done a wonderful job and has answered your questions out. really well. So, um, on behalf of the faculty, I'd like to Ooh. present you with a wee gift, and oh, thank, you. thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, um, we we actually have some prezies, uh, Chris and uh, Kim. Do you want to come up? So I'm sorry, this is for inviting me in the madness of it all. I invited Aileen. And <laughs> oh. oh, I know <laughs> that one! <laughs> you know me well. <laughs> Thank you, Aileen. Thank, Thank you, you all for being a great audience. I am really very tired. I've just woken up in Australia. Um, hello to my family and my staff, and thank you for being wonderful and getting us to Canada. And thank you all in the audience for sure. being very patient and listening. I hope I've given the right person. Good man. I haven't the seen them. Yeah, but one's for... Yeah, but I, I, I hope I've given the right ones. Sorry, just swap them. We'll exchange if it's yeah, got a girly one.